I'm Dermot Hussey. Welcome to the YouTube channel for the podcast Riffin Radio. Tony Rebel has always personified the conscious DJ Sing J, whose consistently positive messages not only edify, but also disarms us with their humor. Besides also being a record label owner, since 1993, he's best known as the host and producer of the definitive Roots Reggae Festival, Rebel Salute, committed to the preservation of the music. Tony, it's almost 30 years since Garnet Silk died, and as yet, we haven't seen a talent like his, a spirit like his emerge. Why was he so special? Well, he is special, and if you notice, my adjective would seem as if he's still here, because he's still here within our hearts. <laughs> so he is special. And he's special because he was sent. He didn't just come. He was sent. He was a he, he was sent from a divine space and had a divine order. And therefore, even myself, who who was very close beside him and with him, and has helped in a lot of his development, um, sometimes we think that it is. A little complicated, but at the end of it, you could see the reason why it is. Because it was really a divine order that he was on. And he himself um, have done and said many things that indicate that, that, that it was that way. How did you first meet him? Talking about that, I was telling Queen Africa last night that the first time I met this man, I was in, I think I was in my team. And I was DJing on a song called Tropical Depression. No, Thunderstorm, sorry. That was the name that we call it when, when it didn't play right. We call it Tropical Depression because the name of it. <laughs> I remember one time I was playing in Hatfield and they told me that a little DJ from the area was on a new song that came about. Um, when a new song is in the area you want to know the sound you want to see if the mic sounds better or if they have different equipment um, from what you have used to so i went over there and this i saw this little skinny bridging dj talking about the head bone connected to the neck bone and the neck bone connected to the collarbone but i saw that his voice was one in a million and somebody asked him to give me a <laughs> give me a talk off the mic and he didn't pay that much mind. And so we were there until we left. Didn't get to talk to him, didn't get to touch the mic. But in 1983, I won the, the, the uh, parish DJ contest for Manchester. And I was doing some shows around in Manchester, Cross Keys and all these places. And he was one of the artists that was on the bill. And we just started talking and realized that his name was Smith. Because at the time his name was Bimbo, and but his real name is Garnet Smith. And so he told me who his father was. It was a man who called Bola Smith. But my mother's name is Daphne Smith. My grandfather's name is Dudley Smith. And from where I'm from in Manchester, his dad used to come and check my grandfather whenever mm -hmm. he was going to St. Elizabeth and they always play dominoes and all of that. And so I didn't know the connection with the Smiths at the time, but we just hold on to that and say, well, if your daddy Smith used to check my grandfather Smith somewhere, those Smiths are just Smiths. So we are brothers, you know what I mean? And we just start from there until we, we actually kicked off a, a, a nice musical combination where we try to assist each other in, in, in doing music and the spirituality came about because of of how we were living and the struggles at the time within the music to me a direct response was to dig deeper in self and dig deeper in self actually 
that exploration um, resulted in a deeper finding in spirituality. I can remember one day we were in the hills talking, myself and him, a cousin of mine by the name of Bunny and James Smith and somebody else there. And the way we were talking about things, just trying to unravel lots of mystery of the earth. When we when we finished, he said that, um, boy, if we if we are supposed to leave this space and get back to a normal space from where we were in our head, might as well we go now. I never forget that. Mm. He was a serious spiritual man. At the time, one at the time, he was seeking also because he was he joined the Mormons. It is said. I mean, I've read where they said that you help to change his spiritual identity. Is that true or was it something that just evolved both of you simultaneously? That's true. I mean, uh, me, he kind of knows everything about me and I knows everything about him in terms of how we're growing up as two young men. Um, he, we, uh, most people did not know about that Mormon story and, and I was there because I was a Rastafarian from early, long before all of them who are my friends who became Rastafarian. So to me, in not a boastful way, I was a little ahead of my Pan-Africanism and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and a deeper level of spirituality, um, linking to Bible too. Because at the time, we, we, you know, if you listen to a song that I did called Nazarene for you, see that I quote Numbers chapter 6 and Ezekiel 44 and all these places. Because I was always looking for what would you call now, something to substantiate what I was doing in the Bible. And so these were some of the reasoning that we had. And of course, yeah, you know what I mean? I, I, I don't know if I convinced him, but I'm sure that we shared certain moments that he, I did not become a mom and he became a Rastafarian. <laughs> Were you responsible for introducing him into like Kingston or into that new atmosphere? Now some serious story does. Um, <laughs> so I, all of us was in Manchester and we, we were some real talented artists. You know what I mean, myself, Garnet, Bimbo at the time, Everton, Blender, um, Super Black used to be there, Little Kirk. All of these people used to be on a song called Destiny International. It still exists. I mean, the selector by the name of Chava still do work in England now and and um, still have some of those what one away, very unique cassettes or on CD you now that we used to do in some dances. Culture Knox was on it too, which is Free Eye Son. Can't mm. forget him. Mm. So, we used to be on the sound system like every week, like three days per week. And because everybody was so tough, we had to resort in making loads of lyrics. So you can't come and repeat yourself too tough because when you repeat yourself, it would seem as if you you are not so good. And it, to me, he's my DJ because I just love how he DJ he DJs with a lot of melody. But I remember he was telling me that, look here, I can't DJ like you. Know? And I said, boy, when you sing, those times Sanchez used to, you know, say, you're not Sanchez, you are dirt chess, yo, you, are, <laughs> you are so bad. And then the whole decision decided that because he could sing so much, he wanted to start to sing. What could have done both of them? However, we realized that it, 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 we did not have the adequate facilities in Manchester. And so we decided, so why it's Kingston. I had a, a grand aunt, some grand aunts in Kingston, um, and I came to town and tried to check them to stay there, but it never happened at the time. But Major Stitch, who used to play Youth Man Promotion, was somebody who I know who used to be on some sound in Manchester, and I, I, I stayed with him a little until I ended up um, getting a place at my aunt. Had to pay my rent and all those things, and and said, "Why it looked like it going to happen?" Because I actually met somebody who cared me and introduced me to Donovan Jermaine. No, well, before Donovan Jermaine, we used to go to to um, 
Striker Lee down at Dwayne Park. We were in Pembroke Hall and we used to go to Burns Avenue where Striker Lee studio was because Queen Africa Daddy used to be there too. I think he did the first album with me and Garnet Seal called um, Dance Hall Confrontation. That is Derek Morgan I talk it. So I, I, I was in Kingston and making some moves, but I knew that these brethren were so good that I never want them to be in Manchester and I am in Kingston. So I decided that Garnet, you have to come town. So he came to town, but he came to town when we never have enough even living facilities. So he would be in Kingston and we walked to Dwayne Park or we walked to Greenwich Farm <laughs> from Pembroke College to check Derek Morgan and all of that kind of stuff. Until I remember he said that, you know that me love the music, but the music not love me. So I'm going back to Manchester. So he went back to Manchester and decided that he was going to do mechanic. However, there was a guy, and I think you need to talk to him too. His name is Delroy Collins. He produced the first song for Garnet, Garnet Save, which is called Problem. And he produced the second song for me, which is called uh, Starvation. He was there and, 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 and Delroy was saying that well, he would go and pick him up all the time and trying to encourage him, say, you, you don't need to do this because you are talented. And I remember all the time when he called me to we were talk on the phone, trying to say, tell him that, boy, you need to come to town, man. It's town, the thing is that. But like everything else, if you are encouraging somebody, you have to make sure that you show that it is worthy. The time I was going to the studios and I, I actually at that time I met Donovan Journey because he did meet him at first. So I was down there every day with Dave Kelly and was putting out one and two songs and compilation and fortunately he was hearing them. And so he called me and said, boy, I hear you, man. Every time I hear you, I just know some enough down here. And so I'm come to, at this time when he come down now, I have a room in Pembroke with a kitchen and a bathroom and one bed. And I have had a, 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 two children and, and their mother. And then he came at the time with Lovey, which which was his wife at the time. And so we have one room and we had, we, we had one room, one bed. So what I did was let the women and the children sleep on the bed and me and him sleep where we call downstairs, which is we set up our thing on the floor. And every night we would sit and we would talk about things that we would do futuristically, both in music and and, you know what I mean, just our other ideas, uh, you know, philanthrop philanthropist kind of thing and so forth. And I used to go now to Germany and I introduced him to Germany. Um, I remember the first time I introduced him to Germany, Germany and said, yeah, man, I can't sing, but you don't have no lyrics. And you need to write some songs for him and all that kind of stuff. And... Uh, <laughs> We, we, we didn't pay that much mind because we know he could and so he, he he put down some songs down there um tony rochester was somebody who used to be around me because he used to live around the road and i me and tony used to par and then you know they actually tried to they learn how to write songs i think his father is a musician so he he could play they the family could play like piano and guitar and so forth. I think his father teaches me how to teach me how to play piano too. Um, Tony now start to advance in writing and start to write with Garnet. Even though he writes, he writes for Garnet, but a mm -hmm. lot of times Garnet is writing. Garnet is saying the thing, but he's writing it and putting it um, in in the proper context and so forth. Mm -hmm. So he was there and I introduced him to, to other producers. I remember, if, if anybody can remember, one night I was on White River Reggae Bash and I called him up and he sings Seven Spanish Angel. I think that was the time when, you know, most people in Jamaica really say that this young man can sing. Anybody who knows me those times always knows it's too like a slim virgin. Yeah, one with Afro and one with locks going through. We were everywhere. Everywhere I get a call, everywhere I get a chance to go on stage, I would call him up so he would get his his experiences going. But it was when 
he actually, I remember once, I remember I used to tell him that, um, yeah, you're singing, man, but you need a hook, you know, because you just sing. I remember one time somebody gave him a poem and he just sang it. But, but, but I was saying that it needs the hook, the chorus. And I remember one day he came to me and said, boy, I find something, you know. It never have much hook, but the melody was so good. New found love is like a brand new toy. <laughs> like that. And he, rec he, he recorded that and he was getting some play, but I think it was when Jamis did my belly full, but my style, really start to see him more and accept him for who he was because he was there going on shows with me and all of those stuff. And they hear him and thing, but when they start to hear his song, then the whole place just explode and he just grew into this monster of a Rastafarian youth and, and somebody who wanted just to do good and to sing only good songs and somebody who keep his sabbath somebody who read the bible to the crowd somebody who pray regular i mean the person that i knew he he actually surpassed that mm -hmm. kind of a mentality in such a short space of time it, it, it was admirable i remember the friday night before he passed the friday when he passed, the Saturday before he passed the Friday, I, I had a, a show in Manchester and I might be jumbling now because there's so many things to say, so I'm here, there and everywhere. I remember I went, I, I remember I went to Manchester because RJR had a, a outdoor shows in the town. And at the time, he, I think he he was on a hiatus, did not perform a little while because I think he had low blood pressure and all of that kind of stuff which most people never know and so and I I was playing football I was training and had a a back injury and I didn't know if I would get down there and he was on the phone with me and he said no man no, I'll call Pee Wee and he called Pee Wee and I remember Pee Wee she telling me that I should use an iron take it as hot as I can and put it on my back and and actually, I actually felt better. Went to Mandeville and he was in a Tony Rebel shirt and I was on the stage. I didn't know, he told me that he was coming, I didn't know. And I tell you that the man appeared. And when the crowd, because both of us are from Manchester, when they saw him on stage, it was pandemonium. Mm. When we did unheard Christian soldiers, we left there and went up to his house. And was there all day. That was about seven days before. And in the evening, I said, well, you know, I'll go back to town because it, him deciding he's not coming back to town, he's staying in the country. And the man took out his Bible you know, and tell every, every male to uncover their head and every female to cover theirs. And he was, he was reading from the Bible and like he read one line and sang the next line and just stay watch. <laughs> And I remember when he, when he was finished, he saw that I was turned away because, you know, I never really knew that part of him. And he said, don't worry about what you see, man. You're going to see many more things. And I never forget that. He told me that that night, seven days after. I remember I spoke to him Wednesday, the Wednesday, the Wednesday, because he came to Kingston on the Tuesday. And I was going to Bahamas on the Thursday. I had a show there with Nancy Wilson and Luther Vandross and, and um, Diane King. I was with Columbia Records at the time. And he was at Free Eye House the Wednesday morning. The man Culture Knox and them called me and we were just laughing and talking and was telling me that boy, I went to Richard Stevens' birthday party last night and, and I never felt like singing so before. So I said, why you never just singing? He said, no. You know what I mean? I couldn't dominate the man um, party like that. But he told me that he never felt like he wanted to sing that much. And then it just happened that boy, the um, December, the same, uh, uh, the next week, or the February week, two days after. Because I, I spoke to him the Wednesday and I think the Friday night it happened. So it's so one of them things, it's so one of them things. But the, 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 the question that you ask about is spirituality and why you haven't seen anybody else like that is that there is a whole lot of work 
that was done in the whole preparation musically because we used to be on sound system all over the place and we used to just be DJing and those were like our Edna Mandlin. We actually was practicing how to be in a dance hall where five people is, but you find out that 300 is on the outside. So we had to go inside, do our best, and, and cause those people who are on the outside to want to come in to see us. These were the kind of training that we went through without even thinking that it was training him. We used to be all over the place. We used to listen to a lot of music. We wanted to, to send our kind of messages that we were thinking of and talking about to the world. So we had to think, we had to listen to, to uh, thoughts that were positive. We had to be reading Bible or we get into our spirituality. And I think that in our hearts at the time, because I can, I can reflect and it's like yesterday, we all knew that we had something to do for the world. We had something to do to the generation that was in that time. Some positive things to say because we always look at the negative too, and we we thought that we had the comparative advantage at the time in music, and 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 we actually use our spirituality to fuel that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I don't think. Um, well, I don't want to say because I don't I don't hear a lot of people's story, but I don't think the way how we actually were trained and prepared in that central part of Jamaica in the Carpenters Mountain. A lot of people are doing that. And maybe not until somebody uh, ha gone through that routine again, where you develop your spirituality and you develop your musical career at the same time, you develop your voice without even go to, go to voice training and all of that stuff. You balance that with, with how you grew up through you know what I mean, the, 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 the not having all of what you want or having very little, but can think about um, certain necessities that you would want uh, and then you work hard for it. Um, maybe it will be a little while before you see somebody else like that. Or from my perspective, there will be only one Garnet Silk. Which of his songs resonates with you the most today? Um, Consider the Garden. Consider the Garden is, is his thoughts at the time. He was explaining how he felt about uh, the earth and mankind. He understood that there is a variety of people on the earth, but they are all living in the garden. So I, I, I think about that. And I was there when a lot of those songs are written too, because a lot of songs there that I um, have lining, uh, or maybe the, the chorus is mine. Like when you hear, I gave you everything I've got, it's me and my lady have a problem one morning and she walk out and me just write it and say yeah but it's so good i can do it and say go call him and <laughs> him just do it when you hear your love is divine i'm the writer for those two but when you hear love me baby i am the chorus and few lines in it and so forth when you hear sweet jamaica for me like Money in your pocket, and God did die. That's him. If you hear everybody balling one day, one day, the melody that says, But the wickedest thing is when you don't have none, and you're full of this. Those melodies are his. So that is how we work. Because we did, we never, when, when we're powering, we're not powering for to say, I'm going to get some publishing, or he's going to get some publishing. We were just exercising our, our musical potential, and it was done out of a happy um, place. <laughs> we just wanted to do that. We just wanted to get it right. So, but all of, all of his songs, man, like, 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 um, 
See me and I know me about the passing judgment. Those songs. I love those songs. I know why those songs, right? You know. Me know Cherry, Cherry promised not to take her back. Me know why do those songs right, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, they mean a lot to me. You know what I mean? They mean a lot to me when I hear them because I, I totally understood the occasion, the incident, and then the penmanship that came after it. Tony, Wonderful recollections, my brother. Thank you so much. And I want to tell you is that the, the, the truth is, the truth is, uh, because it's so much things, there is so much that I I never even talk about. But uh, next time, at least I hope that what I said, uh, it could give you a better understanding of the man behind the music and uh, the kind of spirituality that came through and why. Thank you, sir. Yeah, man, respect, respect. <laughs> I, and I must also congratulate Queen Africa and her choice of Nina Simone's four women. Excellent. What? I'm telling you that, that um, I love Nina Simone. And when I, when I, when I heard it, produced by Steve Marley and I listen to the rhythm I say all right this rhythm is serious but when I listen the way how Queen captured it I, I said boy Nina Simone would be proud to hear you on the reggae rhythm I I, I, I appreciate it okay, because she was she was into the music too yes yes, you know yes she did Baltimore music. she was the f she did Baltimore in a reggae a reggae version before Tamlins did it you know that's cool. That's That's, yes, yeah, man. Baltimore, if you, go, if you go back and check it, if you look for it, you hear that was a reggae track, and then Tamlins and them heard it and did their version with Sly. I remember, I remember Baltimore, I, 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 because I love Balti the Baltimore that Tamlins did so much that when Sly called me a few years ago to come back on the Baltimore rhythm, it was such a special thing because I used to practice the DJ on that. Um, in, in, in the dance. But you know, that is the great thing about you, Dermot Hussey. From from you were on radio here in Jamaica and we were listening to you. It was not just that you were playing music, but you were educating us. Thank you, brother. That educated us. Yes. And, and you, you have just done that a while. And it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't, de it wasn't deliberate. It was just sharing with you the vision. <laughs> I didn't set out to teach, you know, I just said, man, this music is so great, it's about us, I need to share it. And that's Aleppo what... Can, Aleppo cannot change this part, that's who you are, and you do that brilliantly, and I appreciate it very much, sir. Thank you, mother. God bless. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> One love. Love, my brother.